Kharagpur, I believe, 1996. And then he spent one year uh, in ADA. And I guess, um, uh, what was it? I forgot your discipline in IT Kharagpur. Aerospace. Aerospace only, right? So that's ADA. And then you finished your PhD in 2003 from University of Minnesota. Minnesota. Right? And then after that, uh, you were at Texas a and I did some postdoc and some job, uh, but eventually found my calling in academia. <laughs> so now he heads this lab of uncertainty quantification in an, an associate professor now in the aerospace department of University of Texas a and So without further ado, I would welcome you uh, here uh, to tell us more about opportunities in UAE. So uh, thank you for um, this opportunity. This is my first official trip here. And uh, you know, I'm enjoying it. It's a lovely campus, a very you know, energetic faculty pool. Uh, and you know, I'm well, very excited to talk about some of the things I've been thinking about uh, implementing. Um, so the talk is essentially going to be a little more motivational challenges, opportunities, and maybe some research questions towards the end. Um, uh, so there's both you know, fundamental ideas that can be explored as well as some applied translational things that can be done. So this is the engineering side of Texas A&M. Uh, uh, that's the aerospace engineering. That's where I sit. Um, <coughs> and uh, uh, like Professor Bernadette said, I kind of work on this answer quantification. So growing up in Calcutta, I was not sure about things. Um, so I wanted to really understand how sure or how unsure about I am about unsure things. So that <laughs> went on a recursive thing. And anyway, so jokes apart. So uh, UAVs are making a comeback. So that's fantastic. Uh, Facebook is hiring aerospace engineers. So that's you know very optimistic. Um, you know, hopefully Google will also say that there's life beyond deep learning. But we'll wait for that. Anyway, so new opportunities. So the idea is to kind of describe what. New applications have opened up uh, because of these uh, you know, low-cost uh, UAV uh, technologies. Um, so agriculture uh, drones are are very you know much um, in uh, in practice. So when you have like large hectares of land, how do you um, you know survey? So the first generation of drones uh, or UAVs, uh, like we like to call them are essentially sensing platforms. They don't interact with the environment. They are essentially observing and gathering data. And so based uh, on that, uh, you know, certain actions can be taken, which could be automated by robotics or manual driven. OK, so the initial uh, entry was on uh, you know, agriculture. And so these are like fixed wing uh, drones in which uh, they will you know, they need to cover large areas. And so there's lots of research questions on optimal path planning, coverage, uh, dynamic sensing, etc. cetera. Um, and so they are essentially doing something. They're not flying around. So you know, they may have a, a hyperspectral imaging system that is taking such pictures. Um, and as it's flying through the, the, the flight path, the speed, um, of the airplane is related to how quickly the cameras can take pictures. So there's a constraint uh, with that. And if there's, let's say, a wind, it cannot roll too much because you know otherwise it's taking a picture of a wide range. And so post-processing, which is mosaicing all these pictures, can be a problem. So there is a connection on how well this thing should fly so that the utility of this guy is uh, useful. So you know, in this kind of um, um, uh, data, then you know we can try classification algorithms and say which part of the agriculture needs water, which needs uh, fertilizer, and then you can send somebody or send uh, another kind of a drone that will probably go and fertilize those areas. So um, these, you know, there are different vehicles or different designs for different kinds of application. Since this needs to cover large areas, um, this these applications, long range, uh, fairly linear path, uh, flight path, these are usually described uh, you know, well with fixed wing architectures. Um, whereas these have to fly slow, they have to kind of hover, uh, make maneuvers in closed uh, environments, these are going to be more uh, um, you know, uh, helicopter-like designs or quadcopter-like designs. And they will have to uh, carry uh, you know, payload, with the fertilizers, and things like that. And so <clears throat> Depending on the kind of application that is being pursued, we have to fundamentally think how, what kind of vehicles we are going to look at. So agriculture drones, they, they, it's a big market, uh, big opportunities, uh, lots of challenges uh, um, in terms of you know, vehicle design. Um, the next category is journalism. 
um, news gathering. So in news gathering, the objective of the drone is to hover as long as it can and kind of detect newsworthiness. Um, how does it find newsworthiness? So there is you know, some sort of a, uh, AI or machine learning algorithm. Um, and so the objective is to kind of hover in one place as long as it can. So again, you have seen, you know, uh, CNN has a drone uh, unit now um, in which they are, you know, just using off-the-shelf hardware uh, with a camera and they're getting images and shots of things happening. Uh, operational constraints exist, uh, so um, it's not very clear. Um, so there's like journalism, ethics, privacy, safety, newsworthiness, and all these things. So these are the, this is the utility that the drone should provide under these constraints. So uh, they will dictate what is the performance for that vehicle. Uh, what, what capabilities this vehicle should have, um, that is going to be um, uh, an important factor. So people working on journalism drones will have something else to worry about. Um, the next kind of application that is really coming up um, is infrastructure assessment. So Nokia wants to look at all the cell towers. It's very difficult to send people there. Um, they want to see if cables are okay, if the, if the structural integrity is okay. Um, you know, pipelines uh, for oil and gas. Um, <clears throat> they want to understand if someone, you know, if there's a leak, uh, what is happening, take a closer look. Um, bridges, you know, the infrastructure aging. So the, the bridge problem is very interesting because they want to understand the health of the bridge from the structural dynamics of the bridge. So they will send one of these platforms um, to take a video of the structure as it's, you know, it, which may seem uh, stable in our naked eye. Um, and so the vehicle has its own dynamics. It's move, you know, it's kind of bouncing around in the wind. It's not perfectly stationary. And the structure is also swinging and, yeah. So, so actually I understand that Hale in India is interested in uh, monitoring gas pipelines. Mm -hmm. And they, they want a 50 kilometer range. range. For that fixed wing, of course. Yes. Right? Has, that, has, that been, uh, has there already been uh, a lot of uh, development in that direction? So Exxon and Shell in Houston, they have a unit uh, <coughs> in which they are buying off the shelf fixed wing. So their application is, let me just see things we are, you know, uh, at a place and I don't want to send anybody there. So they're buying off the shelf, putting in the camera, and uh, sending it out. US government has uh, allowed non-line of sight only recently. So they were limited on how far they could uh, go over so there. So I understand, so Gail is actually interested, so this could be a, yes. a start the stepping off stone to build a Absolutely. drone industry. In Ab India. Absolutely, so if, I, mean, I mean, these industries that are looking at these new opportunities will pull you know, some of these capabilities, and uh, and that's fascinating. So are these uh, autonomously flying and doing their tasks, or is there a human pilot who is controlling these? Right now, the aut it's not 100% autonomy. Most of it is RC, RC, because they want line of sight. You cannot let the drone beyond, you know, LOS. So right now, they're all RC. So all it's doing is just hovering and uh, taking pictures. So this is a very interesting problem. Uh, the civil engineering colleagues at Texas A&M, uh, they basically what they do is the video footage will have two modes of oscillation. One is a, a higher frequency, which is coming because of the drone's response to gust and stuff. And this guy, which is going to be a very low frequency. So they will do kind of like, you know, your video cameras have image stabilization idea. That idea is used. And they will look at the, they will try to estimate the harmonics of the structure. And from there, they will try to estimate the health of the structure, which I found extremely interesting. Um, um, and so this has to have a control system that will achieve certain kind of gust projection um, and so that the data that is getting, which is in this case a streaming frame from which they will find out you know, the dynamics of the, of the bridge. So pretty uh, fantastic. Uh, and then as I'll show later, that this is the largest market segment, not delivery. Uh, infrastructure assessment is the largest uh, uh, in terms of service, not the cost of the drone, but you know services and um, labor and things like that. But um, this is my favorite conservation drone. Um, so Lian is a Princeton alumni, and he an aerospace engineering graduate, and he worked in Southeast Asia, and he bought off the off the shelf uh, drones. And he was able to track poachers. In fact, the sight of a drone was uh, you know, discouraging enough that poaching stopped significantly. So you know, he's flown stuff in Gaziranga, 
um, and, and there's a lot of signs. So they have taken pictures of you know flora and fauna on Amazon canopy, which they did not know existed. They can get very close, uh, they can track animals, and when they have RFID chips, the drones come in, they get the data and move out. So a lot of bio, um, you know, conservation related data is is uh, available. And so this has kind of opened up, and then there's a TED talk, which is just fantastic when you get a chance. Um, and recently joined as a faculty. Um, so this is, you know, another great application. So you have to kind of follow herds of rhinos and herds and kind of National Geography uses these to get some really crazy footage. Um, maybe one day Bollywood will have a drone and a camera to get some cool action scenes or, or some high energy car chase, yeah. Aren't these poachers clever enough to shoot it or do something? <laughs> they fly pretty high. They don't want to shoot because then they reveal their position. Well, but they, <laughs> sure, but the thing is that they have to disable it, they want to disable it. But I think it's you know pretty much out of the reach. These things fly at a fairly high uh, altitude. Yeah. Yeah, you said they follow the herd, so they have some control yes. mechanism yes. to detect and then yes navigate accordingly. Yes. So you know, <coughs> and in fact, um, extreme sport uses these things to you know video footage of Olympic ski <coughs> or so. Ski, yeah. So all those things are coming, but they are not. Intelligent, I mean, there's a guy who's flying it, man. There's a strong human in the loop, but I think there's a lot of opportunity to kind of, uh, you know, bring in autonomy and, and more capabilities will be generated. So this is a good space. Delivery drones is what we hear in the news. Um, so Amazon is exploring a few things. This is like a standard quad with a box, uh, um, <clears throat> and then they're looking at a vertical takeoff and landing vehicle. So it'll take off like a helicopter and then transition to forward flight. Um, Google wants to play. Google's design is interesting, and you can see it's. I think this is a Photoshop thing. It looks like the same image, uh, but this is the real one that they're using in England um, and also in Australia. So Google's drone research uh, in Australia—that's where the UAV is—and they're trying to deliver packages. So this is a tail sitter, uh, uh, and it has rot rotors, two rotors, uh, and then in this design there are four. So the propeller draft. Uh, is used to then use these as control surfaces. So the wind is generated with the propeller and then it can change the control surfaces to get attitude control. So it's a tail sitter, it takes off and then transitions to forward flight. And the delivery, um, you know, I think it's either tethered or it just drops. So people are still exploring these spaces and then Domino's has a, you know, something that they want to deliver pizzas. Um, and then Walmart is also looking. So th this is the last mile problem in which, uh, you know, that takes most of the revenue and so hopefully um, um, you know, this this will become uh, mainstream, especially in hard to reach places, and that's where this company, Matternet, the Matternet is the uh, you know, internet is all about data, so they want to make a network with matter. So the company is called Matternet. Uh, they've been you know in it for a while, and they've had you know various uh, iterations of of quad rotor based things. So they focus on lightweight, high value, like medicines, blood samples. Uh, organs, and they partnered with Mercedes because Mercedes has this organ delivery uh, thing, and so the last mile for organ delivery, I would say. Um, <clears throat> Zipline is more uh, mainstream, formed by uh, MIT alum. Uh, they operate in Africa, so you can see these fairly large uh, fixed wing vehicles, and um, <clears throat> they've kept it very simple, very rugged design. Um, easy to maintain, a bicycle shop can uh, fix you know, components of the uh, vehicle, and it is launched. Uh, so there's a catapult, um, so there are, there are stations where these things are there and there's a medical facility, so someone calls in, I need blood of this type, someone takes that, puts it in the box, and launches it, and it has all the GPS and connection, etc. it just flies. Uh, the delivery is not that, uh, um, I don't want to say inelegant, but uh, you know, it doesn't stop. So it'll slow down and just drop the package and again continue forward. And the landing uh, is essentially, it drops into a net. And then someone, somebody pulls up the drone and puts, puts it on the wall. And they've you know, been on the news and, and, and fairly good, uh, you know, robust operation. Anyone can use it. It's easy to operate these drones. It's not a high-tech uh, operations for anybody. Um, so atmospheric satellites, this is something that, um, both Google and uh, Facebook are uh, working. Um, so these are designed to be at you know, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, very high altitude, stay for months. Um, <clears throat> um, and, and they basically you know, play the role of uh, satellites. 
um, Facebook wants to put uh, you know internet and whereas these guys are looking at more weather patterns and you know agriculture and other um, uh, real-time traffic following so if you want to track a vehicle over long distances something like this will have the resolution uh, to have instead of a satellite which you know only updates the map um, so frequently so th these are some of the technologies and it's all solar powered and um, you know massive engineering um, uh, in this so this is the market um, the UAV market as determined by Pricewaterhouse it's fairly old um, so infrastructure is the big um, thing the total you know market size is pretty large um, and this is commercial this is not military um, <clears throat> so agriculture is you know close second transport um, and you know, security entertainment insurance and things are there so we have seen a lot of media coverage on transportation but I think you know according to this report the, the infrastructure assessment is the uh, big uh, economic value um, of this. So, I mean, each of these guys require the vehicle to be designed and, and the vehicle to have certain capabilities. So, um, off the shelves will probably only work so much, but uh, we need to kind of have an integrated way to design these things. Um, if you really want to buy, these are the top 20. So, DJI, as you know, is uh, really good. The surprising part is Parrot. Parrot was nobody two, three years ago. Um, because it was, you know, Xiaomi, the, the one I showed for CNN, that white colored drone, that's the company from um, Xiaomi. But Parrot just came up, and so, you know, drones are drones. I mean, there's really nothing going on. Four props, a control system, Kalman filter, you know, everyone knows the component. The penetration is you can buy these now as gifts for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Kids can fly this. So they've made it very easy, user interface. That's the value um, of these. And, and some of these are, you know, Airbus is into this game. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, if, if you want to make something like this here, it's, it's, it's doable and, and, and people are, uh, are doing this. Um, yeah, yeah, here is your comment on this slide. See, when we were doing this experiments, we had thought about which thing to buy. We zoned on Parrot was for only one reason. See, you can, the SDK is open. Yes. That's the only reason. So DJI, is, 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 capacity-wise, they're both same. But DJI you won't open the SDK, so it's, it's hard to develop things. So you can't put your own code in there. Exactly, yeah. and Parrot, at least for science research purposes, I mean, I don't know what I don't know what others though. So this was a number one player a few years ago, 3D robotics. So Pixar was marketed by them. I see. Now you can see the broad, right? Um, <clears throat> so Qualcomm, this is a San Diego-based company. So Qualcomm may have bought them. I am not sure because Qualcomm is big into uh, into this space. So. 3D Robotics was number one. My initial, you know, I would buy stuff from 3D Robotics, but now we make our own, so we don't. Uh, so you have platform and software. What is that distinction between them? The 11, number 11 is software, whereas most of them are platform. So category um, is, see, drone display is a software for, let's say, mission planning. You know, it interfaces Google Map. You can put your waypoints, uh, and then that talks to a open source. Um, the robot operating system, ROS, has very nice interfaces to many of these things. Uh, and so if you really want your algorithm to be widely adopted, you probably should put it into ROS. Uh, and yeah. Can you comment on the Indian scene? What's, what's happening or not happening? There's a lot of interest. Yeah. A lot of... Uh, what companies are coming up or anything coming up? So Bangalore has a lot of energy. <laughs> Uh, and it, these are isolated energies, and they're trying to rediscover uh, each aspect of the drone design. So I don't think uh, there's there's probably a traffic. I, I know there is a you know, friend of mine who's looking at traffic management or uh, monitoring, but um, hardware-wise, I think you still have to buy things or three D print your stuff. I mean, it's really not hard to make our four metal rods, you know, DC motor. That's okay, but to get the software, the full package, I think people eventually buy one of these. Things. So, manufacturing development wise in India, I don't, I have not seen anything. In terms of end usage, um, yes, there is a lot of need. I think agriculture is one of the things that is picking up. Uh, yeah. In some sense, this is the uh, perfect uh, uh, leapfrog technology because on the roads, trying to change anything is impossible. The changing up above 200 feet is perfectly easy. Mm -hmm. So this is something that India should absolutely be playing a very important role. Absolutely, um, you know, um, 
survey, land survey, ag agriculture survey, the economic, agri-economics, you know, you need data, how do you get the data, you use a sensing platform, um, um, you know, keeping track of kids in large school, uh, do you put stationary cameras or you put two drones that is monitoring, you can think of uh, many applications. So I would love to see an Indian company um, do this, uh, you know. So is there any distinction between the companies about fixed wing and the... Uh, These are mostly uh, uh, quads. Mostly quads, right? But most applications you're talking about would require a fixed wing, right? Fixed wing. So fixed wings are a little complicated design. So you know, who, who makes this fixed wing? Right now, I have not seen. I mean, Aero environment will make uh, will will have some uh, designs, uh, but most of these are, uh, you know, epsilon delta perturbations on a quad on a quadcopter. Zipline, for example, is fixed wing and. They are not a company that makes drones. They are a service. I know, but I'm saying if you want to develop something. Yes, like that. so that will be a little more involved. So you have to build that. You have to build that. So that is what I'll talk later. Like, if you want to build a you know a drone like. There are calls that are asking for you to build drones that will be at a very high altitude, uh, will have this kind of radars. So then it's a higher payload. You're looking at not maybe uh, electric, but maybe a gasoline. So ah. Controlling a gasoline engine is itself the control system is a problem, latencies and whatnot, right? So that's like uh, so. You know, these drones are essentially three PID loops in three axes, and linearization is a double integrator in each direction. So it is a very simple thing to do, and amazing performance has been shown. But once you have an aerodynamics, you have cross coupling winds and whatnot. So it's a um, complicated design, um, which should be also within the real. I, I mean, whatever the application needs, that's what I'm saying. Okay, so design, build, and fly. So let's say you know you want to build something. Um, these are some of the design challenges that uh, you know I think are absolutely critical. The ones grayed out is you know are important, but that's not my area of focus. Um, so ve vehicle design. Uh, depending on what applications we have. We'll have a fixed wing design or a multi-copter design. Sensing is very important. What kind of sensors uh, you want to put in. One is the IMU to control the vehicle. The other is the application. Uh, you know, is it going to put a hyperspectral imager? Is it going to put a radar? Are you looking at methane concentration? Are you looking at uh, detecting mines? Um, are you helping our geophysicists map out magnetic field in a large area? So it'll have all kinds of uh, uh, sensors that will be needed. So, you know, sensing, uh, data fusion, and of course control system design to kind of achieve the kind of things that will make this platform useful for the domain. If it's kind of, you know, if it has a lot of role instability or load damping, it's just oscillating. It's not very useful for certain application. So that's kind of the vehicle level design, vehicle controls, and uh, vehicle centric. Now is, you know, what is this guy going to do? Uh, so we need a high level of autonomy. Um, so motion planning is very, very important. Uh, how do you optimize the flight path so that, you know, given the charge of battery, you can maximize the utility? And the decision making in uncertainty, because, you know, everything is unknown if you're doing vision. Vision is, uh, in my opinion, computational vision is going to be the main sensing for, you know, SLAM and knowing uh, where we are. Um, this is something Dr. Kumar works on, unmanned traffic management. So you're going to have a lot of these guys. How do you manage resource bandwidth communication? What are the rules of engagement? Uh, can I grab your Amazon delivery? Uh, uh, you know, so those kind of things. Um, situational awareness, you know, where are you? Uh, what's around you? And how do you get from A to B? Uh, can you get there with this charge? Uh, and if you can't, what is the safety? Um, and of course, legal uh, aspects of that insurance, if drone hits my car, my window breaks, who pays? Um, those aspects are always uh, there. Um, trust, this is very important. Do you trust, uh, you know, if you have you know, hundreds of these drones delivering um, pizzas in the campus, will you feel comfortable? Um, you're comfortable seeing people driving cars. Uh, but will you be comfortable seeing a lot of these unmanned stuff moving around? So cyber physical security and privacy and liability are very important. Um, the third one is robustness, airworthiness, and VNB. This is very important because uh, for the drone to work, many things have to work in unison. The, the aerodynamic design, the structures, the control law, the software, the real-time calculation of the control law, the embedded processor, the charge, everything. It's, a, it's, it's not just an aerospace, but it's, it requires everything. So it should not crash, essentially. And if, it, if there's a failure, how does it recover? Or, uh, you know, if there's a graceful degradation. And the third one is you know, human-machine interface. How do we work with this? What is the best way? 
it can complement uh, what we're trying to do in the system. Which is VNB? Sorry, I didn't uh, Verification and validation. So, you know, how correct my code is, how, uh, you know, is 2 plus 2 really giving me 2 plus 2? If, uh, or if there's a programming error, or if there's a mathematical error. So, uh, those are kind of what is VNB. So, key steps in UAV design, this is kind of what we follow in the lab. Um, I try to enforce in the lab, and students don't follow quite what I'm trying to say. They're like my kids. I tell them to do this, they'll do exactly opposite. Uh, so That's deterministic, right? Stochastic, random no, walk. Deterministic, exact opposite. Exactly. <laughs> in the space of, yeah. So this is, you know, a, uh, I'm going to show you three uh, kinds of vehicles we are uh, working on. This is a marriage between fixed and a quad. Um, so we've got uh, you know wide span wings, um, and we've got four quad rotors. So it takes off like a quad rotor. Um, the quad rotor is a little challenging because now I have moments of inertia, which is pretty spread apart. So I'm going to get very poor damping uh, in roll. Um, and so it takes off like a, a quad, and then the front two props swing down, and the back two props swing up. And this guy and this guy have opposite uh, angular velocity, so net angular momentum is zero, so I can easily move them without it getting any gyroscopic uh, damping. Similarly for this, okay? And then it just moves forward uh, like a regular, and you can switch off the front, front too, um, and then we may have to add some control surfaces, but with just four props, I, I will have full control uh, in, in controlling this vehicle. Um, <clears throat> now the question is, uh, a decision has to be made on what kind of propellers we are going to use. Uh, so, you know, when we worry about efficiency of propellers, the propellers that are efficient for hover, heavy lifting, are inefficient for forward flight. Um, I cannot switch these. So, um, you know, if this is going to spend most of its time in forward flight, I'm going to choose the propellers or design the propellers to be efficient in forward flight and then take a hit on efficiency on the landing and, and takeoff. Okay, so that's the kind of trade off um, that we'll have to do. Um, uh, this is another one uh, that is uh, designed to be kind of a, a flying wing uh, design in which we have uh, four rotors and we're exploring a ducted fan design instead of a propeller. So propellers are more efficient, uh, but they have speed limits. So you know, if you have one big propeller, the efficiency uh, in terms of energy to thrust uh, improves, uh, but as you go higher speed, the propeller uh, induces drag, and so that is not uh, very efficient, whereas the ducted fans are designed for uh, faster forward velocity. Uh, again, this is a, a trade-off between, uh, they are terrible for lifting uh, uh, in, a, in a vertical, but the idea is we are going to spend a lot of battery and energy in, in, in getting to a forward, uh, you know, hover, and then quickly transition to forward flight, and we'll spend most time. So this is a, a more higher uh, uh, speed uh, uh, design uh, that we're looking. This is a tail setter that is going to be either hand launched or is going to be catapulted. Uh, so it'll quickly transition into forward flight and you know it'll fly low speed. Um, so the the airfoil uh, that is chosen for this is uh, uh, in a very high lift. Um, now if it is high lift, um, um, I have other restrictions in terms of maneuverability and you know the stalling of the uh, of the wings. But this is another uh, vehicle we are designing. So um, this will not have any hover uh, 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 capability. So this is going to be either, you know, mostly mostly surveillance uh, kind of design. Um, and and so if you have a requirement, the way it works is when we have a requirement, we start choosing the airframe, the shape, and then the weight factor comes in, how much battery we need, um, and so it's a it's an iterative process until we find a sweet spot. Um, to design these things, so that's the you know the other era vehicles are being designed uh, in a virtual prototype. This one is uh, closer to uh, deployment, um, and uh, we have made some simplifications um, <coughs> um, yeah, I mean, in the design. Like we didn't get a full blended body, but we just uh, attached uh, two epoxy coated foam wings, uh, and some of the stuffs are three D printed. And, and most of the electronics and hardware are off the shelf. So our first attempt at flying this, and let's watch the video. This is right next to my lab. So because of the wind and the big wings, uh, we stopped it right here, it crashed. Um, 
So failures will happen, uh, but there is a way to minimize. So what my students did was they took Arduino Pilot. It's a standard thing, and Arduino Pilot has configurations whether you want to do quad or you want to do fixed. And there is a misconception that if you give the right geometry, the controller is robust enough to do all these kind of things, but it is not. Um, so you can't take their PID control system and just tweak the gains and and you know plug and pray uh, to see what is happening. So uh, to make it fully reliable, you really have to get into the details uh, and and. This can be, um, you know, this is a, a process. So we can certainly minimize, and then the rest of the lecture is, is, you know, how do we do this in a more reliable way? What are the, you know, principled ways? Um, so the first one. So you know, when an airplane is flying, there are, you know, four things that are happening. One is aerodynamics. Okay, that is a property of the geometry, how the how the shape is of the airplane, the flow physics about this uh, surface. The second part is structure. So the, f the flow is generating aerodynamic forces. As a result, the structure is vibrating, twisting, turning. And that, in turn, is coupling with aerodynamics, and there's interaction. OK, fluid structure interaction is happening. Uh, so I need to account for the structure side. The second one, uh, the third one, is propulsion. What kind of engine uh, performance I have. Uh, so most of the quad rotor, there is this propeller wake that has to be accounted for in the design to get the, uh, the performance um, uh, we need, and then the fourth one is the control system. Okay, so these four things have to work in a, in, in unison to kind of make uh, things work. But we can't do it all in once. Um, so this is kind of a, a step by step approach. And I'm showing some of the you know industry uh, tools that are used to make these drones. So the first one is a preliminary design in which we treat everything as a linear system, a linear world. This is a linear world. Um, so, this is a NASA developed, uh, NASA Ames developed, I think it's Ames, Open VSP, which gives you uh, very nice tools to do some preliminary aerodynamic analysis using vortex lattice method. Um, so here we assume that you know <coughs> there is no viscosity or and um, you know there is no compressibility in the in the uh, fluids, um, <coughs> and then. We look at the linear aerodynamics, the linear structural dynamics, and we look at the rigid body dynamics um, as well. Okay, and then we essentially look at if these are the operating conditions, this is the altitude, this is the weight, uh, all those various parameters. In that linear world, we can get um, <coughs> very good answers uh, for that. So that will tell me what should be the size of the wings, what should be the size of the fins, what should be the size of the elevator. Yeah. Is it linear aerodynamics? Yeah. Um, the equations uh, are linearized about some trip. So vortex lattice method is putting all these vortices at this grid, right? And so then you compute all the drags and uh, all that. Yes. Okay. So there are various versions of this. Um, <coughs> AVL is a is a package developed at MIT and is very well respected in the vehicle design. Um, AVL will do uh, dynamic stability, trim calculations, like can I have this airplane fly at that altitude or at that uh, speed. It will give me rigid body modes, uh, so it will tell me you know, the eigenvalues uh, of the rigid body motion. Um, so it is a very good starting point, um, and you can get uh, kind of a, you know extended back of the envelope calculation to kind of know your space. Once we finalize this, um, this is also very important because there are, you know, two main difficulties. The first one is, as the airplane is, you know, kind of moving forward in steady level flight, depending on the equilibrium flow condition, I will know what the lift and the drag is. So that's kind of an equilibrium uh, aerodynamic interaction. Um, but we need something called stability derivative. So as the airplane is in motion, what is the rate of change of the lift as a function of the angle of attack derivative? Those things we can't do. We, you know, wind tunnels are very expensive. We can't run CFD, a full, full CFD on that. So those are done in the simplified uh, vortex lattice slash linear um, aerodynamics. So um, this step is to characterize the aerodynamics and the structure of, of the system. So once we get a nominal design, then we use high fidelity CFD and structural dynamics uh, tools, um, such as uh, STAR CCM, 
Um, and there we now look at viscosity effects. Uh, and uh, you know the fluid structure interaction. So if this is a flexible wing, as it's flying, it, it's going to warp the wing. And so what is the loss of aerodynamics in that? So I'm looking. For, these are more high-end uh, uh, UAV design. We can also look at aeroacoustic uh, signatures. How much noise is, is it going to generate? Uh, and so some of these vehicles can uh, do that. So the whole purpose of this exercise is to construct some lookup tables. That. The end product is to get a lookup table that if the vehicle is flying with this speed and at this angle, what are the aerodynamic forces and moments acting? Because that will go on to my rigid body equations of motion. Okay, so this exercise is a little time consuming and, and would need some expertise in, in aerodynamics. Uh, uh, but the idea end product is I need some aerodynamics lookup table. So the third step is uh, we do a detailed CAD drawing um, of everything from propellers, propeller mounts, to the screws, the brackets, everything in SOLIDWORKS, because these are anyway 3D printed. So someone with a CAD background will have this. Um, and now this gives us, in, in this design, these two propellers are going to turn um, and, and go down, and these are going to swing up. So there's going to be a hinge. And so the angular momentum interaction, the multi-body dynamics has to be accounted for. And so SOLIDWORKS allows us to draw these things uh, and kind of extract a multi-body dynamics equivalent to that drawing. So if you design a mechanical system with rigid you know, pin joints and ball and socket joints and other things, this guy will actually give you a multi-body dynamics. You don't have to hand derive uh, some of these things, so we can move pretty fast uh, on that. At the same time, you can select materials. Um, I think it also connects to a website that is very popular for uh, hardware, MacMaster, MacCar. So you can actually select materials from the website, so you'll get the densities and everything and throw it into this so you can get really very high accurate rigid body models. Um, so I will, end product is I will get a very accurate um, in estimate of the mass, the center of gravity location and the moments of inertia uh, based on this uh, stuff. So there is uh, going to be you know less error um, in this. Um, you can even put batteries, lipos, uh, and so the battery volume you can go really full detail uh, so that everything gets 3D printed and, and clips. So step four is, is what I need to move forward, a virtual prototype. So I'm gonna use aerodynamics and structural dynamics information um, from AVL and OpenVSP and Star CCM, And I'm gonna take the solid body dynamics and I'm gonna put all of that together in possible to do in many environment. I usually do it in MATLAB sim mechanics environment because SOLIDWORKS will port the thing directly into sim mechanics. So I have a complete um, virtual dynamics, um, the aerodynamics the lookup tables, um, and that are generating forces on the system, and the rigid body dynamics are coming from SOLIDWORKS, and so I can start uh, you know, playing with the drone in that virtual prototype environment. Uh, this is still all physics. Um, so once I have a very high fidelity nonlinear model, uh, I am going to start thinking about how to design control laws. Um, and so <laughs> linearization is a natural uh, you know, first step, uh, and, and you can trim the system basically you know, finding out the propeller forces so that it is at hover. So finding equilibrium um, configurations, what would be the inputs. Um, and then there are many ways uh, of doing, you can pick your favorite. My background is robust control theory. Um, so I do, uh, I apply two approaches. The first one is um, I'm going to treat the nonlinearity because this is a nonlinear dynamical system. Um, I'm going to treat the nonlinearity as a model uncertainty. So, for example, if I'm on hover uh, or I'm doing steady level flight, um, I'm going to linearize about the steady level flight and all other maneuvers around that. I'm going to get a different dynamical system. I will treat it as a model uncertainty, an unstructured model uncertainty about the nominal plant, and then design a control system to, for example, be gust tolerant about that nominal, accounting for this unstructured uncertainty. So I'm going to get a certain kind of a performance uh, for that. And you can do a fixed architecture, for example, PID, or you can do full H2, H infinity, uh, assuming you can run those in the embedded processor, and that's a different consideration. <laughs> Or you can actually you know, do a gain schedule controller at different trim points. So the controller interpolates as the vehicle is changing its configuration, okay? So you're expected to get higher performance, more aggressive. But for the kind of application we're looking at, I mean, these are not going to do dogfights. 
these are going to be very generic, benign motions. Uh, so I think you know your PID probably would work, and then you can do some analysis based on robust control theory, uh, because PIDs are computationally easier than some of the other things. So that's the idea. So you know I'm going to get a nominal plant, uh, and I'm going to model everything I don't know as an uncertainty, and then I design a controller that will essentially stabilize or give me some bound on the error norm uh, for you know not just one plant, but the whole bunch of plants uh, that I expect to see during the operation. And so one way to represent uncertainty is you know, I take a nominal plant, uh, which is the blue line. The real guy has you know some high fidelity model. So I'm not going to explicitly account for those. I'm just going to say you know the real guy, which is just one realization, is going to be the blue line plus the dashed line. Um, so everything in between that band, I should be able to guarantee that performance. And so that's re referring to the first uh, approach. So these are standard robust control uh, um, techniques that we use in uh, um, you know, flight control, for example. So that's all inner loop. Inner loop is, you know, I have a reference. I want to track it properly. Or I have disturbance uh, and sensor noise. Uh, and I should be robust to those. Um, next, uh, you know. Um, we, we have to see how you know, who is generating the reference and, and kind of the bigger picture here. So I like to think of it as a three-layer system. The all the things I talked about so far is the inner loop vehicle level control. This is close to the hardware. Okay, uh, this needs to know the model of the airplane, um, and and so the the uncertainties are disturbances and non-model dynamics and things like that. There's a mid level and there's a high level. So let's talk about the high level first. It's a global planner. Global planner does not need that fine detailed resolution of the vehicle dynamics. Okay, so we are going to look at the global planner as a discrete system. So you have an environment. Let's say there are these red uh, patches, which are which are hazardous areas, and uh, the planning here is you know kind of waypoint. Um, so you can do a discrete optimization, um, and there are probably you know many ways of doing this. So you essentially want to go from start to end, avoiding all these. Uh, uh, bad areas, and you come up with a sequence of waypoints that is is giving you a path. But because you know these are discrete points, your vehicle has limitations; it can't turn very quickly. Uh, so I have to respect some vehicle constraints. That's where the mid-level uh, planner comes, and it smoothens out the discrete and puts some kinematic constraints on that, and then it connects essentially uh, the waypoints with a smooth, uh, dynamically feasible uh, path. And so, um, the, you know, one of the ways it is done is this non-convex feasible set, which is you know avoiding all the constraints and obstacles and hazard areas, is essentially you make a convex uh, cover, and then you there are lots of algorithms that work uh, on that, and then you find a dynamically feasible path going from uh, end, and that is the reference the inner loop controller has to track. Okay. Um, and so that that is what uh, comes in. And so the good thing about this is is you have performance, robustness, and uncertainty at different resolutions in space and time. Okay. So wind gust is a short time phenomenon; is a faster dynamics, and that is addressed right here. But if someone, you know, some car comes in front of me, uh, that is at a larger spatio-temporal resolution, and you you address that at that point. You can't do a monolithic formulation because it just becomes computationally impossible to do any of these planning. Um, and so you, know, you also have you know, coarse variables representing things that are at a larger time length, and you have fine variables describing things that are um, you know, at small uh, space and time. So this, you know, this, this abstraction works uh, for some of the things that we have done. We haven't done it for UAV, but we have done it on a ground uh, uh, system. So um, you know, a little bit detail on, on this outer loop. Um, so the obstacle-rich environment. So you have an apartment complex, and you want to deliver something and not hit anything. Uh, so this you know, empty space is your non-convex feasible thing, and it would fly in this area and not hit uh, everything. So this is a vehicle that we worked long time ago. And at that time, this whole quadrotor thing had not picked up. This is like 2003, 2004. Um, so one way of stitching the uh, discrete point is to use a property called differential flatness. Uh, so all the videos that you see, uh, Vijay Kumar and Rafi Andrea, they are all using this differential flatness idea. Um, so the idea is very simple. You have a full physics, uh, rigid body motion, uh, so translational and rotational motion. Um, and so we don't try to control everybody. Uh, uh, we, we find a reduced space. So you've got 12 variables here. 
three translation, uh, six translation and six rotation. Um, <clears throat> if your vehicle is in a particular configuration, this, this will not work for any arbitrary configuration. So our motivation was to design a differentially flat uh, dynamical system so that we can do these tricks. But this system is differentially flat as your quad rotor. Um, so it turns out that my true degrees of freedom can be x, y, z, and phi. So x, y, z are the positions, and phi is uh, the roll angle of this uh, vehicle. Um, if you give me x of t, y of t, z of t, and phi of t, I can recover all the other states and control, algebraically. And that is wonderful. So you can see the, the, the your angle psi is a tan inverse y double dot x double dot. So I'm assuming x, y. So if you draw a line in x, y, z, that is the trajectory, I will be able to invert that dynamics and tell you what should be the fan forces so that the vehicle will follow that trajectory. Uh, and that is possible. Of course, I'm inverting the dynamics means any uncertainty in the model will make my thing uh, uh, invalid. But the idea is then I'm going to use an inner loop to uh, give me uncertainty with respect to model uncertainty. So for this vehicle, you know, I can just choose four flat outputs, x, y, z, and phi, uh, and then I will recover everybody as uh, functions of these four variables and their higher order derivatives. Okay, so that's uh, highly doable, and and, and there, that you can really um, use this idea to generate very aggressive uh, maneuvers, like you know, playing table tennis and all those other demos, like flipping a wine glass. Um, if you kind of do some other architecture, you'll, you'll, you'll have uh, accuracy issues. So this flat business works uh, very well. Um, and so the, f the flat stuff is essentially taking a 12-dimensional system to a four-dimensional system. So then I'm going to do synthesis in the four-dimensional system and then map it back to the 12-dimensional system. So computation, it becomes much easier to do these things. So for example, um, you can now do a path planning. You can put an optimal control formulation in terms of the four-dimensional space, uh, and, and this is essentially saying that I want to go from A to B by minimizing time or minimizing energy, and so the math is, is there. And so, you know, because it's in four-dimensional space, I can do these path planning algorithms very fast. Um, and, uh, and so this picture says that, you know, if I did not know any obstacles and I want to go from start to end, you know, that would be the, uh, the yellow line would be the one. If I knew obstacle one a priori, then it would be something like this and, and continue. If at point A, obstacle two pops up, I can replan. Uh, and then it kind of goes in that way. And if I knew both of them, um, then that's the optimal. And well, that is symmetric to the other one, assuming, you know, gravity is going into the page. So the point is, these algorithms that are at higher level have to run in real time. Um, so we have to look for a formulation um, uh, that lets us do these things. Uh, so the right coordinates to solve the problem is very, very important because you get tremendous computational advantage. Um, so fantastic. So now I have my inner loop control law. I have outer loop control law. Uh, somehow I have to put all of that into an embedded processor. Uh, and then put it in the vehicle and then do my flight test, okay? So the way to do this um, is kind of do a, a model-based design. So the virtual prototype that I showed you, um, we developed the virtual prototype in Simulink, which gives me the entire uh, the physics of that. Uh, Rhapsody is another such framework. However, big problems happen if I don't uh, use my, if I don't account for the hardware model, the processor, the disk access, the memory access, if, you know, if, if this is a multi-threaded uh, you know, platform, two uh, applications may go for the same memory, so there'll be race condition. Uh, so then it is not a problem of the control law, but it's a problem of the implementation, but it will eventually fla uh, f uh, fail. So the, you know, the, the real idea is to model everything in a virtual prototype, not just the physics, but the communication. Uh, the the uh, quantization, am I going to use an 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit, 64-bit? Is 64-bit really needed? So you're asking these kind of questions because you would really want to optimize um, uh, these things. What is the you know, IO, IO bandwidth? How fast is the communication? Are you, are you uh, over-designing? And then all these specifications, then you kind of, you know, 
decide whether you're going to implement it on a Intel or a Pixhawk or a Motorola, or are you going to build a custom processor? Or the answer is there is no such hardware that can implement this. Uh, so you need to go back on your design uh, in this world. So this is absolutely critical. This idea is very much rampant in your, uh, you know, electronics, because they, in, in that space, that industry moves very fast. What is the concept today is a product tomorrow. So they must make sure that the phones and the batteries and these multifunctional activities uh, uh, don't fail. Um, but now has become a standard in all embedded control systems. So NASA, Air Force, automotive, everyone is kind of using this idea. So this is a little, um, you know, pushing the limit on what's conventionally done. But this is the right way to make sure there are no problems. And I have not built my hardware yet. This is all virtual. I'm taking care of all the things that I can a priori before I even fabricated anything. Okay? So there is the flight test. So things can still go wrong, but I have accounted for as many as you know I could early on. Yeah. Any question? Oh, okay. So now is the real time. When the rubber hits the road, right? We we want to fly this. So there are many assumptions we have made. Uh, one very important assumption we've made is we have used high fidelity aerodynamics to kind of understand some aspect of the aerodynamics. But we have still used linear aerodynamics and you know, inviscid flow to understand uh, aerodynamic damping, things like aerodynamic, uh, you know, if it's spinning, the drag has a damping effect. So there are coefficients, uh, for example, coefficient of lift and its sensitivity to pitch rate. Uh, so CL alpha dot CLQ, those things are very, very hard to get. And we rely on linear aerodynamics, lots of approximations. So there's inherently a lot of uh, uncertainty in the model. So when we fly this, we gather a lot of data. We'll, we'll do some specific maneuvers, and then we'll try to recover or fine tune those aerodynamic variables. Um, the rigid body parameters, inertia, structural stuff are very well characterized, but it's the aerodynamics that kills us. Um, um, and so we do a system identification based on all that data. So we'll perform the maneuvers and, and things like that. Now if you see, uh, based on the uh, refined model, we may either redesign the airframe, we may see that the structures are not strong enough or it is vibrating quite a bit, or the support that is holding the camera is shaking too much for the video to be useful, and then we have to also redesign the control law. And so when you do that, um, things work a bit better. Um, and this is in the lab, we're doing a big risk. Uh, so I was in one corner, all the students were out, and then another student was far away, and we just, and this was not the first attempt. There were many failures. I'm showing you the best. Uh, but, uh, um, so it is a bit involved uh, process uh, to actually get these things uh, flying. Um, so that's, you know, so that's kind of the process. Uh, and, and these things can be taught. Uh, you know, we can train, um, you, know, you know, we can have, um, a degree program in which you know it's a uh, it's a method method that people can be trained in, and we can get these things. But there are there are more you know, challenges um, because the the age of UAV is not just the vehicle design. It is what is that guy going to do? Uh, that's the value. You know, any company trying to form will say, yeah, cool. What is it going to do? Uh, so there are lots of CPS challenges, and you know, I want to spend the next few minutes. Uh, talking about that. So when you have you know, a whole bunch of guys flying around, uh, there's all kinds of things going on. You've got to have uh, you know, obstacle detections. Uh, you don't want to mess up with these guys. You've got an active uh, ground avoidance. There's a lot of communications in you know, various bandwidths, various formats, um, computation. Uh, can you do all the processing on board? Are you sending it to the cloud? What is the time scale? Uh, lots of things are going on. So we're kind of now going back and kind of thinking what is the uh, you know, right way to think about this complexity? So vehicle can be designed. So in my mind, I like to categorize these three things as uh, uncertainty uh, you know, in three buckets. The first one is dynamics. Okay, here is the, the complexity is physics. Um, and we can, we can use to, uh, you know, conventional robust control theory uh, uh, to kind of understand the physics uh, complexity. But in real world, uh, the sensors and the actuators uh, are, are, are connected by a communication channel, 
And there the complexity is information. So timeliness of the information, uh, what is the communication topology, who talks to who, do I have a communication uh, here or do I have a communication uh, there? Uh, that's easier, that's harder. Uh, uh, sorry, the other way. If you have a control communication, it's harder, that's uh, easier. So complexity of information is, is very important. And how do you do, so this, this whole area of network control system talks about these kind of things. Uh, the third one is a favorite. It is the um, you know, uncertainty in computation. So you have a processing board. It has only so much uh, you know bandwidth, and you you have a multi uh, multiple tasks, and it's a real time. You have to guarantee that every task gets executed within the deadline, and, and it's a multi rate system. So precision of calculation is really not useful because the longer you spend computing, uh, the more invalid or stale it becomes. So it's not relevant anymore. So there's a sweet spot because you know you have to kind of that's the optimum. So this is you know we, in in the control system design we'll say you know, I have infinite time and there's no utility and once I finish calculation I am multiplying a matrix with a vector the product makes no sense unless unless the entire calculation has finished. I can't just stop it. I can't preempt it. Right. So that's useless. Um, so this is the cost of time. Um, so this graph says that the value of the computation declines the longer you take to compute it. So there's, you know, there is a new kind of new way of thinking about computation that it will keep improving the time you know, as you give more and more time. But if you preempt it, that's the best you have. Uh, so you can run with it. So this is more real-time embedded systems folks understanding, and this is a huge impact on the uh, uh, validity of the function because. If I can't compute a control law in 100 hertz, that is useless. Either I put a bigger board, or can I bring down the computation, or can I run PID for some time and H infinity for some time, and I can switch back and forth. So the overall utility is different. Uh, so there are lots of ideas that can be pursued here. Um, so that's the uncertain part. The other main important is, you know, we need to think about how UAVs are designed because the applications are becoming so ubiquitous and, um, you know, you buy one vehicle or you design one vehicle, you spend two years. If the mission uh, changes, are you going to redesign everything from scratch or is there a way to build on what you have done, uh, some sense of modularity? Um, and so uh, we are thinking about, you know, a, a design mindset which is modular and composable not just in terms of the vehicle components, but the software also. So you know, those who work with embedded systems, you know, composability is a major concern, right? Um, um, and uh, so how do you put together things very quickly and guarantee automatically that the composite system is going to satisfy all the reliable questions? Uh, but the more modular you are, the less efficient you are in terms of uh, in the resources. So there's a trade-off between uh, <laughs> how well, how, how efficient the design is versus how flexible the design. So this is an army, uh, this is a Navy UAV that is optimized for one specific task. Okay, so vertical takeoff goes in and, you know, uh, does uh, Navy related activity. But if this was uh, uh, changed with some other hardware, um, you know, you will have to do the entire design again. So most surveillance drones, uh, if they change to more combat drones, the hardware changes, so then it is a new vehicle, and so it's again a new process. But is there a way to kind of do this rapidly and kind of, uh, you know, each module has its own guarantees and then the composite system has a guarantee? So that's a research idea. So I'll give an example. So let's say you have options. I'm, I apologize for the low resolution. This is the best picture I could find. Uh, the paper is um, available here. You have one fuselage design. Okay, you have one tail design, you have three wing designs, and you have two propulsion, a, a jet and a prop. I can connect these in six ways and get six vehicles. Each will have its own mission limits, performance guarantees. Um, so is there a way to do this uh, systematically? Like you want to invest in component technology and then at some point, uh, these are kind of like eigenvectors, and this is the space of all the UAVs you can map uh, with these components. So this is a very interesting way to think about system, and this is an example for the uh, you know for the UAV. Now, when you have a you know prop versus a jet, the software inside will also have to be accordingly um, um, uh, developed. So you know, if I want to kind of elaborate this intellectually, um, you can think of that you know you have you have to make a this is a design flow, and you want to build a drone. 
And then, then you identify key articulation points, let's say airframe, communication, software, right? Within the airframe, there are many options. Uh, so you do a design space exploration, um, and you look at all the possibilities that can be accounted for here. Um, and similarly, you do a design space exp exploration of the software and the communication. And then is there a, a method that will, you know, you can, you can construct your system by picking one solution from their one solution, and that mapping tells that if I map this solution with that, it is implicitly guaranteed to be robust. Okay, so the certification is uh, inbuilt in that. So this is a little more researchy, uh, but to be, um, um, you know, uh, agile and flexible, um, we certainly need this uh, composable and modular design because it takes 10 years. Predator is a 10 year project. Um, um, uh, so can we shorten that uh, design? Um, so just quickly, uh, the idea is essentially you separate what needs to be done versus how it should be done, and you exploit virtual prototyping as much as you can. Um, so in the drone world, you know, we build a virtual prototype with uh, the state of the art that's available, and at every level, um, I am eliminating bugs or errors before I add another layer of complexity. Um, so people worry about um, am I going to program it in C, or am I going to program it in Fortran? Uh, but that decision need not be made at very high level. That has to be addressed at the right level. Am I going to, if I switch a 64-bit processor with a 32-bit processor, will the entire thing uh, fail? Will my control law still work? But that consideration should not be accounted for when you are actually doing the control law design. Um, so. Um, so this is a design V. This is commonly used in automate, automotive industry. So this is more requirements, and that's the final product. And you get as you get closer to the physical prototype, and you're doing field testing. At each test, you're fixing a bug that only occurs at that level of abstraction. Normally, what happens? You build everything together, and you test it at the end, and it's an interaction, and you have no idea what's going on. Um, so you want to test the software first, the hardware first, then the interaction uh, separately. Excuse me. So this is the way that we should be doing. So the grand challenge is, I have a basket full of computational units, basket full of communication, and I have uh, some uh, airplane components. Can I quickly put together and make a UAV in the field? That's the grand challenge. And then let me motivate you with this video. And this is the last slide. Uh, so I dream of having these things built, which can detect objects. They use machine learning to attach. Then the boxes and the ducts become vehicle. The software in these are adapting to the new inertia properties. They deliver them um, to a container. And then six of them lift the container. So this is scalable uh, aerial platform. Um, so that's the target. And then with that, uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. How far are we from this? Very far. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, they'll get more employment. First, let us thank the speaker for the excellent. Some questions or comments about this talk? Yeah. Yes. 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 So robust control will not solve everything. Uh, so tall building aerodynamics is big because you get all these local vortices and they're pretty powerful. So any proximity operations uh, with a drone is very hard. Um, so that's really unsteady aerodynamics. Now the ground effect is helpful uh, if you're know if you going on a forward flight. So airplanes crash because of poor design. What happens is during takeoff, they're close to the ground. It gives an aerodynamic spring effect. So at a low speed, it can take off because the ground effect is pushing. But the moment it goes up, they lose the ground effect, and the airplane crashes to the ground because it, it was not accounted for. So the takeoff velocity has to be more 
Um, so, good question. So, we will, you know, the idea is to use aerodynamics, computational tools, experimental ideas as much as we can. Uh, even if you want to include it as a model uncertainty, we can't deal with unknown unknowns. When I say, you know, this is the model uncertainty, there's really nothing uncertain about it. I know what it is, right? So the known unknowns can be better characterized with more, more, more sort of information. So yes, as much as we can model. So how much of uh, reduced sort of modeling around the structural dynamics, the aerodynamics, uh, because the because why was you are looking at anyway linearized aerodynamics? Yeah. One way reduced sort of model. Yes. But then beyond that, to use a high with all these last so MDO, multi, it, it's a multidisciplinary optimization, and it is a very hard problem, and it is a sequence of ad hoc techniques uh, which you know gives better results. But uh, very good question. There is no such elegant way. So one way is to uh, so the what we do is we use linear structural dynamics, we use linear unsteady aerodynamics, and we get as much as much mileage as we can. And then we replace some of the uh, CLCD stuff with high fidelity CFD. And uh, if it is a cheap, cheaper vehicle, we fly it. If it is expensive, we put it in the wind tunnel. Um, and uh, but the wind tunnel will not give me aerodynamic damping. Um, you know the the stability derivatives; those are always hard to get. The wind tunnel will basically tell me the high fidelity CFD is uh, trustable. Uh, so, it has a few ad hoc things. So then how will this, uh, will this fly? <laughs> they crash and they get data, flight test. So they then fly the vehicle and get a lot of data. Uh, and then they will say that the CL uh, uh, sensitivity of lift to parameter P1, P2, P3 is linear. So you have a A1, P1, A2, P2, A3, P3. So that's the linear part. Then you say, no, I'm going to say it's cubic polynomial, and I'm going to find those coefficients from the data that I've got. So as a least square root system ID. So this is how it is done. Um, it is a little involved. Um, in, in so that any way. other question? Yeah. So let's see. She asked first. Okay, great. You said that after the virtual design, then you do go for testing. So then you are having the engineering for like the as benign as possible uh, in, in the initial phase so when we build this we will now fly the thing just as a hover and then I'm going to put it into a windy situation okay, just one, uh, one dimensional you yeah, just hover in a windy situation and I'll see the robustness uh, because I assume robustness to aerodynamics uh, and so I model uncertainty. So then I can either increase the uncertainty uh, or include uh, estimate the new, uh, so that's the first. Um, so if you're doing fixed wing, we will do a fixed wing um, at a low speed, steady level flight. Uh, and it'll get bounced around by the, the wind. So I don't know the wind. So I will not know all the inputs coming into the system. So that is a, so we try to estimate the wind disturbance. So it is not very elegant right now. Because the, the, the videos that we get, there are papers on, even on machine learning, people are using for uh, drone navigation. So there we will see these drones are doing some complicated But those are like the final results, right? Before going into that, you start with the basic so the I'm assuming of, you've seen quad rotor yeah. in 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 an indoor setting. Not in indoor outdoor settings. Uh, it's a, there is a recent paper by I think Nvidia. They used drones to uh, not exactly remember it, but they used different kind of maneuvers just to say that this is giving the controller stable, just to validate validate that it doesn't. But it does crash before, right? Yeah. Before it goes into that final. So you have to get the data. So while you're getting the data, uh, if you're using a machine learning approach, uh, you know, you may get into a regime in which the controller cannot stabilize. Uh, and so it'll crash uh, in that environment. Uh, but yeah, this is experimental. We have to be... 
So I want to first actuate in you know force in all three directions. I want to actuate moments in all three directions. If I'm doing a pure quad rotor setting, but if I have something that is a wing, then I'll do a steady level flight. I'll do a dive. I'll do a pull up. I will do a coordinated turn. You know, I'll do a spiral out. So there are some, you know, pilots fly. When pilots learn, they just don't do anything. They are trained to do maneuvers, a takeoff maneuver, a, a turn maneuver, right? Uh, especially come a civilian, like the fighter pilots are doing anything to avoid uh, what's behind them. But uh, the flight mechanics tells us certain flight maneuvers. And if we decide to live in that, in a manifold, then we will test in that manifold. So when commercial drones or even airplanes are made, pilots cannot do anything. For example, the wings are designed, let's say, to have an angle of attack 20 degrees, which is very high. If they get into a situation that is 45 degrees, the aerodynamics has stalled, so there is no control authority on the wings. It's a rock. So, you know, the MiGs 29s and the F-18s, they have a maneuver called the Cobra maneuver, in which they will slow down and go into a very high angle of attack, so they'll basically freeze in the air, so the guy behind has no way to stop, will zip by. Now, two bad things happen when you do that. One is you have slowed down, so the velocity is less, there is no aerodynamic pressure. Half rho v squared v is the important part. So there is no, it's, it's going to drop. The second bad thing is you have such a high angle of attack, your flow about the wing is not giving any force. So that induces something called a falling leaf mode and the airplane cannot be recovered. So 50 such F-18s have been lost. And then they fixed the control law to account for some side slip information to fix that. Um, so we have to be careful when we fly these things. There are lots of unknown regimes. So we define a flight envelope that a pilot will never fly outside this box, and that's the one I test. And I slowly push with the risk that it may crash. Yeah. I have another question. Yeah. The last and now maybe, uh, so one last question. All questions after that would be at the tea break. See, he's, he's still speaking from four, right? So one last question. And, and then, no, no, let's, let somebody else ask, right? Yeah. Uh, so one of, one of somebody, yeah, yeah, yeah sure. So I think one, one reason why you talk about aerodynamics, <coughs> why the, the uh, improving statics that you spread with is because there are not so much involved. Most people are very Yeah, so incompressible, yeah. Incompressible is the first reason. Yeah, and also no viscosity. <laughs> mostly no here, like mostly no here characteristics. So how do you yeah, say? So what I'm going to bring to ask is, is there any research going on? Uh, I'm, I'm sure the CFD guys are, are looking into that. So, you know, model reduction. Uh, yeah, so what kills us in fixed wing is aerodynamics. That is the gorilla in the room. And we try to tame it with uh, linear vortex lattice, inviscid, um, you know, incompressible. But the drones we are building, like, you know, we're not looking at UCAPs, uh, unmanned combat vehicles, going at Mach, whatever, right? Very slow, benign, so these will give us, uh, you know, good starting points, but yes. When you say benign, I thought uh, this was terrible, because when you're going through an urban environment, you have yeah. all these, you know, walls and... That is not benign. Yeah, the one you are, benign. you know, so you don't want to deliver a package close to your window, no. <laughs> you come to the open field and pick it up from there, right now. So there's a video. Uh, I think Georgia Tech has a video. So they have a quad, and they put it in front of a big fan. The quad has no control authority to fight the draft of the fan. It just gets knocked out. So people are researching. In fact, in Texas A&M, we have Dr. Mobile Benedict. He's designing a gust tolerant. Uh, like birds can do fine. You know, there are videos that they will do something in very strong winds, and they'll be fairly motion. So they're doing something crazy with their stuff, right? His research is to understand fluid structure interaction and develop gust tolerant uh, uh, structures. Uh, so that maybe is the way to do it. But you know, quad rotor in, in a strong draft, you've lost your pizza. It's not, you know, it's cold anyway. <laughs> so, uh, I don't want to stop this discussion, uh, but there's coffee outside. Catch the speaker there. So, let's thank the